The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something there beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last close just True, Dr. Zayas. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carwood Company. Folks, we know the world is a mysterious place with a past full of amazing things, despite the shadowy elite's best attempts to destroy and censor as much of it as they can. From early explorers' reports that indicate the possibility of a hollow Earth, and ancient maps that show this and other anomalies, such as Phantom Islands, to out-of-place artifacts in ancient America that turn the official history on its head, there's no shortage of provocative clues for anyone who takes the time to look below the whitewashed surface, and today's guest, rebel scholar Harry Hubbard, has been swimming in the wake of these mysteries most of his life. And being a longtime collector of old books, coins, maps, and artifacts has put him face-to-face with some of the best evidence for a past that looks much different from the one we're given. People who know Harry Hubbard are probably familiar with him due to his involvement in the Illinois Cave Saga, where a huge trove of ancient artifacts were found inside a cave in Marion County, Illinois, that Harry has spent years studying, and he attributes the find to being the lost tomb of Alexander the Great. He's got no shortage of alternative anecdotes and strange sagas to talk about, and you can watch Harry walk you through most of his collections and ideas on his YouTube channel. It's a real pleasure to have him here. Harry, my man, welcome to the higher side. Hey, glad to be here, Greg. For sure, man. This is a real treat. I've had a blast watching your videos and seeing a lot of strange and rare relics up close and personal. Some of these videos you've made, of course, are over 20 years old at this point, but they're still pretty unique, and it's great that you're getting them online now. For those listening that are unfamiliar with you and your work, tell us a little bit more about how you got interested in this kind of stuff and amassed such a huge collection. Well, I guess we can start out. I My mother encouraged me to read, and she said, I'll buy you books if you read them. And so... She bought books, and I read them, huh. and I couldn't fudge any because she would ask me, well, what was what was the third chapter about? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Well, you go read the third chapter, and you come back and tell me what it is. So then I started to pick up because I knew my mother was going to quiz me. I started having to remember what was in these books, and it also with Bible verses. My mother had me memorize half the New Testament, you know, before I was like 14. Hmm. So uh, just, you know, reading and reading and, and developing a love for reading at an early age, and I developed the ability to read much faster, probably after I got out of high school, a few years after I got out of high school, when I really learned, uh, picked up my reading speed. Right on. Yeah, I mean, the collection you have of all kinds of things is just so impressive. And I've always been interested in anything related to the Hollow Earth. And you detail some old maps in your video, the Lyseria map collection. Yeah, that was my old map collection. Yep. Yeah. uh, You mentioned to me that your father was actually listening live when Admiral Byrd was on the radio and they cut him off when it started to get weird. So this Hollow Earth idea has been with you from an early age, it seems, hasn't it? Yes. Uh, my father grew up out west. He had collected UFO flying saucer books. And if there was something back in the uh, uh, late 60s, early 70s coming on TV about UFOs or flying saucers, that was what was on the TV that night. It wasn't, you don't touch nothing. Nobody watches that. He wanted to watch his shows. And naturally, I would watch them with him. And, and uh, we all would. There was nothing we could say about it. He was the boss. And and so he, he was always in. So these books were laying around. As a matter of fact, I still have today several, probably 15 of, of his of his books, UFO books. So obviously, you know, I've always been familiar with the Admiral Byrd story. I think most of us have as part of the Hollow Earth 101. But there are plenty of early explorers who sailed around the northern polar region and southern who have reported unexpected things. Can you tell us about any of them that are lesser known that you find compelling? Uh, just about every one of them. Uh, we mentioned several in the map video of the stories that the guys had seen and, uh, you know, just stories of, uh, of the explorers uh, in the North Pole region that uh, had found the bears always moving north or the birds always flying north. And there was just so much activity, even up until the beginning of the 20th century. And people got lost. People froze. The Longs crew got frozen up in uh, northern Siberia. There, there was it was it was treacherous. It, uh, man had to advance 
to a certain point to be able to conquer those elements. And as I understand it, I don't know, I'd have to do some more looking around on it, but uh, or, or anyone in your audience could, but Admiral Byrd was giving like day-to-day updates or hourly updates or something like that hmm. to, uh, to um, for uh, it was either ABC or CBS radio, he was giving these updates. And he would come on and he would talk about what they were doing and he would talk about where they were at and in different segments. And then it was in the one segment that my dad had told me that it just sounded like it was static and they just turned it out. Hmm. And he had those planes out. It was real interesting the way he, Admiral Byrd, had those planes outfitted for the super cold temperatures. Quite remarkable. He was a brilliant man when it came to fighting those cold elements. Huh, yeah, I think that is really interesting. I've heard other people talk about hearing him live on the radio, and that would be pretty amazing. But is that normal to broadcast, I guess, a military operation to broadcast updates over mainstream radio? That seems a little odd. We wouldn't do that today, I don't think. I don't know that it was such a military operation. It was probably a publicity stunt from one of the telev- one of the radio companies. Mm. I don't know who funded his uh, research, but I would think that the military probably wouldn't want to have their name attached to it. <laughs> but now, we're going to be talking later some about the Smithsonian Institute. And as I understand it, the Smithsonian Institute was actually, and this is in the old books, that it was actually created to study the possibility that the Earth was hollow mm. from the rumors leading up in through the middle 1800s. <laughs> so, so, and then, you know, the, uh, the Smithsonian Institute is a lot like NASA. No answer is still available. <laughs> uh, I borrowed that from Alex Collier. Great, <laughs> great thing. Yeah. They won't let you up in that area now. Right. And pilots can't fly commercially over it because if by chance some plane or jet did go down, you'd hard, if their beacon went out or whatever, or they could not be visually seen, there'd be no way to find them because compasses don't work. It's like uh, when Admiral Byrd explains his compass, the compass goes up. Because they were in a big ball. They were suspended in a big ball of liquid that wouldn't freeze. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, the north, it actually starts to point up. And when it gets just past straight up, it flips around and turns backwards. And that's why on these old maps from what I find is old maps from the 1600s is they got the, you know, the little, the little legend out of the side. You have to go by this bar right here. Yeah. You don't, don't use your compass. Mm-hmm. Once you get up into the higher latitudes, your compass is worthless. Yeah, man, it seems as dangerous as it is mysterious. Of course, those early explorers reported all sorts of things we wouldn't expect today. Open polar seas, greenery, warmth coming from the north. And these might be some of the things you'd experience before getting to the hole, supposedly, if there is indeed some heat source at the top or the bottom coming from an open cavity. But these things weren't uncommon to report during that little sliver of time we call the Age of Exploration. And these voyages to find a Northwest Passage and all that stuff. But there's also fraud in this area, potentially. And two of the big explorers who don't talk about these things that were told discovered the North Pole in the mainstream are Nansen and Cook. And it seems like there are reasons why you doubt these people actually did discover the North Pole, which would help to leave open the hollow Earth possibility. When I went, this was years ago, went through the congressional records, I had a a way to access them back in the mid-late 90s, in the dawning stages of the Internet. And when you read the accounts of Nansen and Cook, it it is obvious that neither one of them got to that. They proved each other wrong, I thought, Mm. very, very well, that neither one of them had made it to the North Pole. And and then when you see the the trail of their journey, just went straight there one way and then came straight back. Well, that doesn't seem possible because uh, the ice is quite jagged. It's, It's razor sharp. You can't pull a sled or, or dogs. It's not like smooth river ice. It's not like that at all. Mm. It's all like bunched up icebergs and mountains of ice and crushed in and this and that. So I, I don't put a lot of credit into those. If it's printed after World War II, I would find it questionable. <laughs> fair, fair. But yeah, I guess at that time, it seems like a big fight for ego and publicity of who can say they did it first. But are there any claims about the about actually going inside the Earth or getting near the hole that you do find credible? Oh, yeah. Admiral Byrd, for sure. Uh, would he be the only one? 
I'm sure there are other credible sources, but I have not seen them. Yeah. There were supposedly some Nor- a Norwegian man and his son that set out fishing one, one afternoon or one morning and ended up going into the North Pole and coming out the South Pole. What was it called? The Smoky God or something uh, like that. Olaf Jansen. Uh, yeah, I, I can't put nonfiction on it. I just can't. I, I, I'd have to see more than, you know, just the tale. Mm-hmm. I would bring something, a, a grape the size of a softball or a grape seed the size of a pecan, you know, something <laughs> to prove that they were there, that what they said was true. Right. It's the kind of thing I really want to believe, but there's not a whole lot of evidence to go on, unfortunately, which makes it tough. Correct. And mm. you've got this one guy, uh, 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 Agnew, a- a- something about Agnew, and he's wanting to mount a... Uh, an expedition to the North Pole. Oh, Brooks Agnew. Yeah, we've interviewed him before. Brooks Agnew. That's him. That's him. And but they won't let you up there. The United States military, Canadian military, Norwegian and Russian military will not will not allow it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's got to be a reason for that. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure. I'm sure they got <laughs> a bunch of reasons. So uh, to talk about the maps a bit, the one that I recognized as the most well circulated Hollow Earth map that you have in that one presentation. It's got the water flowing out of four main channels around four big land masses suspected to be, I guess, under ice now. But you detail in that video, you mention it was made by a guy named Matthias... Matthias Quadas. Matthias Quadas in the 1600s. What can you tell us about his credibility as a map maker? Well, the Catholic Church sanctioned him, so that's one good fight to have in his corner. But he was he was actually making more renditions and and different scripts, slightly different script to a map previous to that by Merc- Gerhardus Mercator, and there was uh, Abraham Ortelius in that same time frame, and also Ramold Mer- Mercator, who was I believe Gerhardus Mercator's nephew, is either his nephew or his grandson, one or the other. I never knew. So that same legend with some extra is on the Matthias Quadus map. But he was not the originator of that actual circular pattern that you see there. That, as far as I know, well, you can go even back to 1507, the map that Christopher Columbus had had those four islands on it, the really? Johannes Roosh map. Christopher Columbus had a Johannes Roosh map, and those four islands were at the top of it. Wow. So that's basically a hollow earth map. Uh, well, um, not so much, but just a, a world map that didn't have North America on it, but it had Cape Cod on it, stretch, you know, the Massachusetts Cape Cod, mm-hmm. but it was attached to China. And you had Cuba lays, labeled as Japongo with a different shape on it. So so there were, I believe that Christopher Columbus was uh, just looking for the eight, missing eight hours on the map. Uh. And, and, and I can't find that anybody in Christopher Columbus's day thought that the Earth, that the earth was flat. That all comes from uh, the 1800s. I can't find it in any ancient language, ancient literature, classical literature. Uh, all of the classical writers talked about the earth as being a sphere. They spoke of the heavens as being a sphere. And, I, you know, it, it, are we so dumb to think that ancient man couldn't look up at the moon at night? Oh, wow, that's a ball. It has dimension to it. Hmm. Uh, oh, look at the sun and, and the sunrise and then the sunset. Oh, that is a circular ball. You know, hey... Chances are, this planet here is a ball, too. So I don't think that anybody ever thought that the Earth was flat. <laughs> Fair enough. Except, except in today's time, since the, what, the, the 1970s or 1960s, there's been a real good push for the flat Earth theory. <laughs> <laughs> don't I know it, man. But when, when we're looking at maps as possible evidence for a hollow Earth or missing land masses, and they have such glaring flaws as missing North America— Obviously, I still find them interesting, but to be fair, it makes it a bit hard to use them for validation because they are so clearly inaccurate in other areas, right? Perhaps. The best rendition that I can recall, I don't have mine anymore, was the Dover publication. Uh, what was it? Geology of the World or something. It was in a Dover. I mentioned it in the Laseria Map Collection video, the book by Dover Publications. It's got the Johannes Roosh map on it, and it's good. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's good. It shows those uh, what they call the Bargos Islands. And I did a reprise on the Bargos Islands in a in the Denver lecture. I showed where the classical author Pliny, or some people call him Pliny, I don't care, Plinius, 
he was writing in, what, 70 A.D. or so, and he writes about the Burgos Islands, the four Burgos Islands, way at the North Pole. Mm -hmm. So evidently, somebody had been there over 2,000 years ago, or close to it. <laughs> yeah. So they are mentioned in classical history. That makes it even more intriguing. And there is a lot of script all around that uh that big hollow earth map that gives added context and details about the geography and the climate. Do you remember any of those added details that are on there? Yeah. I, I like the one that the fishing of sturgeon is good in these waters. <laughs> right. Well, how in the world would they know? <laughs> I mean, now, now let's go back to George Suter. He was a German map maker. His maps were in German, old German. So what does this tell you? It tells you that he was a Lutheran. In 1736, he was a Lutheran. In the 1700s, that's when the Lutheran Church, Martin Luther and his Reformation, and, and Protestant. Okay, so at that time, there were no Lutherans just making stuff up. They weren't just making things up. I mean, you know, he, he had to have had, he had to have been convinced because he was a, a good map maker. Now, he did have one map that they say was a fantasy map, okay? But he never put he never put it out as a real map. This map here... The Schlaraffen land map, he, he never said that it was uh, bogus at all. And he, like I say, it was uh, it was found at his doorstep, the doorstep of his map making shop. Right. He didn't know. It just came, you know, he left one night, came back the next morning, and it was there. So he printed it. <laughs> but there's also other things, too. Here on this island is where the machine that controls the weather is located. Right. And it talks about we have sunlight, daylight, and, and but it's not as bright as the sun. But it's daylight inside, you know, uh, uh, 24 hours a day or however what their day was. If it was sunny all the time, we would just have to go by our clocks to determine what, you know, what day it was or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating because you have this map by a prominent map maker of a continent or series of land masses that is completely foreign. The Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer are both on the map, but they're angled in a way that you could say this would be a map from the interior of the Earth, land masses on the inside. And yes, you mentioned they say that it's light here in both day and night, and the most provocative thing is on one island. It says the machine that controls the weather is kept here. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, my jaw hit the floor on that one. In 1736, they didn't have any science fiction. Yeah, <laughs> definitely fascinating. Is there anything else about the Bargo Islands? I know it's scarce, but is there anything else, any kind of details about anyone who's ever landed on these islands or anything? Not in modern history. No, not in modern history. And all the detail, though, that Gerhardus Mercator, that he put on there, and then all the added materials that uh, Matthias Quadus put into his maps, they're... they're Evidently, they had been there. Okay, like, for instance, when they're talking about the hours of sun in the summer months and the hours of sun in the winter months, mm -hmm. you're not going to know that unless you've been there for a while. Yeah. So they went up there. They did camp. They did spend time there. If you've got it printed in sixteen in, in the early 1600s, 1605, 1607, 8, etc., or even before then in the late 1500s, well, people did go there. You're not going to know that living on the equator or living in the uh, lower lat the lower latitudes you're not going to know that it's pitch black dark throughout the winter or in you know around the solstice times mm -hmm. you're not going to know that right that's good evidence yeah you're just it's, and and also on the quadus maps where they're talking about you can go into this lake here is unexplored but it's on the map and it's on the maps of today Mm -hmm. Well, evidently somebody was there to stand there and say, you know what, I, somebody needs to come and look at that. <laughs> somebody needs to follow that back. And and if you look at the, on the map at the south end of Hudson Bay, well, there's two rivers there. Well, how in the world would they know those rivers were there if they hadn't <laughs> have been there at the south end of Hudson Bay in the early 1600s? That's true. That's true. And again, all this stuff seems to be so old. Have you seen any evidence or indication at all that these islands are there or that the, the hole is there in modern times or have the... Oh, any yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. If you just Google maps of the North Pole, well, I show one at the end of that video. I show one at the very end. The satellite composite? Yes. but th And that was in, what, 67? There were also some from 64, 65, and even more modern today. They show you uh, satellite pictures 
that will show it. And I mean, just um, NASA website, whatever, you can see the outline of those four islands just as plain as day, mm -hmm. just as plain as day. Yeah, you can at least see on some of them that there's been some uh, manipulation or editing done. Yes, on some of the other big grandeur maps of the the world without in, without its cloud cover, some of those maps they they kind of mask over it, you know, with the ice, mm -hmm. and they give a lot of fiction stuff on it, which is typical. That's just you know, anything that goes away goes uh, astray from their theory and what they want you to know. They 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 know how to block it out. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that we have these legends of Hyperborea, which is thought to be a landmass to the north. And then you mm -hmm. have the entrance or the Bargo Islands. There definitely could be something there. Some people had thought that Hyperborea was Bitsenbergen or uh, Nova Zambla and or or even the Bargos Islands. It could be either one. It was it was somewhat ambiguous. Mm -hmm. But they did write about it, and, and they even had legends. I believe it was in Ireland about uh, coming down from the north. <laughs> wow, man. And are there other entrances talked about besides the polar regions that have interested you? Not that I can recall. You, there there are some pretty deep caves, but, but there there is some kind of a heated mantle or or molten rock layers in there because the farther down you go, the hotter it gets. They When I was growing up, they always said that the inner core of the earth was a real heavy, condensed, packed iron, just this this metallic material that's made up of, of iron and magnesium and manganese and, and all of these metals. It's just packed up. And they were told me, like, that one tablespoon of it will weigh a ton. Hmm. It's so packed. It's so compact. And I said, well, okay. And as I got a little older, I'm like, well, isn't that throwing all the properties of physics just right out the window? Hmm. Aren't we just taking physics and throwing it, you know, wadding it up in a snowball and throwing it? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. Right. You can't. You can't compress iron, you know. You're not going to – there's just so much you can do. And then we have, you know, other metals that are much heavier, like uranium, plutonium, that are very, very heavy. But you don't have metal. And, and then if the Earth was spinning at a 1,000 miles an hour around and you had this heavy iron core and it's surrounded by molten rock, well, brother, I'm telling you, man, how, how can anything survive being surrounded by molten rock? Right. How could it have – in other words, we would, it, it, there, it makes no sense to have a solid core of the Earth if their theories are correct, and it would be a hot liquid. There's no, there, you can take any metal in the world and put it in, into molten lava, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change. It's going to change back to a liquid. Mm -hmm. I mean, my gosh, what is, what is lava and, and, and molten rock? That's the elements melted down, and they get extremely hot. Right. That's the uh, iron core is the official story I heard as well. I mean, do you think that there's any justification for an open cavity inside that jives with our scientific understanding? Or do you think it's a liquid core? Oh, I would have. I, I just know what I read, and I'm, and I'm just able to present facts. I really don't have an opinion. I really don't share speculation concerning it. I'm just saying that whatever they're saying is really hard to believe, really hard to believe. Mm -hmm. And with all the... The, the molten uh, rock that's down there and all the elements and ores that are all churning. And, well, where does the actual heat come from? What is the generation of that heat? It's the same thing as what they get from the, from the sun. Oh, well, it's a nuclear reaction, and it keeps going up. Well, who started it? Huh. How did it? Oh, oh, it just happened to fall out of thin air, you know? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then another thing is I've worked with pumps and motors all my life, and you've got these uh, the mountains out in out in the Rockies in the West where hot water, I mean boiling water, comes up out of the ground at like eight thousand feet. <laughs> well, so where where is the steam? Where is the steam deposit? It has to be close to the surface. It can't be several miles down into the the ground because the steam would eventually just turn uh, turn to water, and the water would cool off by the time it traveled eight thousand feet above sea level. <laughs> Yeah, and I know you've also in your past worked with Tesla coils, which is interesting because I think there's a real through line between rotation and anti-gravity, electricity and gravity, torsion fields, and the possibility that the Earth could be hollow. It would kind of look like a torsion field if there was something to that, but the spinning around a central point, I mean, that's what the Earth apparently does, and that's what UFOs do to fly. That's how flying saucers get off the ground, so they say. 
I believe Tesla had the answers to more of the Earth's mysteries than we will ever know. But I feel that probably we we just the world wasn't ready for him. Mm-hmm. The world wasn't ready for him, and he he left his thumbprint completely across the planet. And this planet would not have been what it is today without Tesla. Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, it's such a remarkable mind. Uh, it's unfortunate that a, lot, uh, that a lot of what you read about him printed recently is not true. So get, taking it on the cuff and just examining his experiments and his patents and such, he had more as a uh, as a foundation than we'll ever know. Mm-hmm. And I believe he had more answers because of things that he just figured out. Sure. What What are some of the things that you feel are being talked about with Tesla that are inaccurate? Oh, certain things like it would hurt his ears to hear a uh, thunderstorm 60 miles away. Just things like that. Weird just, stuff. Just fluff stuff, you know, that, oh, he would just grind his teeth when a when a thunderstorm was 80 miles. You're not going to hear a thunderstorm 80 miles away. It ain't <laughs> going to happen, okay? It ain't going to. And it's not going to rock and roll your ears. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Right. So, you know, and, and it's just in some of the books that I guess came out in the 80s. You know, just just trying to make a buck because that's when the surge of Tesla had a reprise, was starting about the early 80s. That's when the uh, Tesla Coil Builders Association got its footing, and people really started getting to beginning to experiment more with Tesla coils and building things in their shop and, and making their own discoveries with super high voltage. Right. It's a shame we haven't seen more widespread adoption in the in recent decades with that stuff. Well, it wasn't going to make the commercial interest enough money. Right. And it was Edison that came up and said, hey, man, if you don't put your transmission in, in power lines, you're not going to make any money with the maintenance. That's how you charge people. That's how you're going to make money is with poles, storms, wires, and consumption. Mm-hmm. So, boom. And he was right. He was right. That's how come all the power companies are super wealthy. <laughs> and it never had to be that way from the first, from the, from the beginning. Right. It's an unfortunate situation. You also mentioned the the Vonick manuscript in that video, which has always been an interesting mystery to me. For those who aren't familiar, it's a book dated back to the 1400s, handwritten in an unknown language. I know you've done a lot of decipherments over the years. Do you have any thoughts on what might be behind that mystery? I, I would think at this point that somebody needs to have the Vonick manuscript sent in to a forensic lab. That's all. That's all I'm saying. It needs to be forensically tested, mm-hmm. and that will tell. That will that will give you everything. That will give you everything. Testing the inks, testing the paper, but it's never been tested. They don't want it tested. They love, as far as I'm concerned, the story of its original passing from one to the next to the next, and it just pops up, you know, again on the scene in what late 1800s, early 1900s or so, when Vornich bought it. You know, what was what actually was the origin of it? And, you know, then I say, well, it came from this guy, came from this guy, came from this. Uh, come on, let's 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 put the Vornage manuscript in the uh, forensic lab of my choice and let's have our experts look at it. And and then we'll be making some determinations. And then if the script is terrestrial, we could bust that script. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, simple uh, investigation is really all it takes and a lot less speculation. But. I guess if they don't want it tested, they don't want it tested. Maybe that I've speaks to being this, a forgery. I've always had this really bad personal issue. It's a problem, and I put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> so mm-hmm. why well, don't others? And that's all I'm asking. Hey, send it in the forensics. I'll pay for it. I hear you, man. And uh, to bring it back to old maps a bit, a lot of them that you show in that presentation, a lot of old maps I've seen, they include – this phantom island called Friesland up near Iceland and Greenland. Some flushed out with details like names of cities on it, too. What can you tell us about this little enigma? Bonden, the capital of Friesland. Well, I believe it was, it was either Forbisher or Davis, I believe, that was the first to actually see it and record it. And they, they drew the coastline, wrote where it was, and, and did all these things, okay, and, 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 and said it was on the map. And, and, Later on, it wasn't there anymore. It wasn't there anymore. But in that same area, it was like in the 40s, I believe they did. They took soundings, and the the, the North Sea, which is pretty doggone deep and rough, there was an area there that was like only uh, like 200 feet below the surface, an mm-hmm. entire area, like 20 miles by 20 miles out there in the ocean. 
that there was the surface, that the surface beneath the surface of the ocean was like 200 feet, not too many, 60 fathoms, something or less, or something like that. I don't, I can't remember exactly, but um, I've got all that documentation around somewhere. But it it appears to me that it just sunk. And that area around Iceland is very active, shall we say, very active. Hmm. And now I also want to point out, and you might be interested in this as well, in door number four, my video titled Door Number Four, that has a bunch of artifacts, my ancient coin collection in it, but I also show two maps in there, a Cornelius Whitfleet of 1597 and another Matthias Quadus of Iceland in there from like 1600 that didn't, that, that didn't make it to the actual Lazeria map video. I would have loved to have had those maps. But then the, the daggum video would have run over two hours, and back then VHS tapes only, I'd have had to cut something else to put them in. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So I did include them in, in another way. Uh, I can't remember if I bought them after the video was made or if they came while we were shooting it or if I didn't have enough time to include I can't remember exactly. But there are two more maps that show, one of them shows Friesland in detail, and the other one is another Matthias Quadus. So that means I had one, two, three. I had three Quaduses. I had three Matthias Quaduses. Mm. And that one Cornelius Whitley, which is a great Friesland. You know, I was a Friesland collector. But the, the Iceland map had on it so many. What I loved about the Iceland map, 1600 by Matthias Quadus, is that it had so many of these sea creatures in it that were described to him. And they drew these in the waters and such. And there's so many creatures in the sea that we don't know about. Mm. You know, stellar sea creature that we don't, we, nobody still knows what that was. And and then they had other uh, creatures that have been wiped out by the, the post-medieval sailors, you know, the ones when, as the industrial world started taking shape in the 1500s and 1600s, they had animals that they just obliterated for food. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them in the, uh, in the northern regions. Right. I mean, the speculation is that when you're out at sea, you start hallucinating or the dark just scares people and they start using their imagination to see things. But you think some of these creatures we see on old maps might have actually existed? Oh, yeah. I believe every one of them did. I've got mm. several books that talk about that kind of post together different instances of different creatures that are that were described by scientists and sea captains. Well, they're, they're, you're not talking, you're talking guys that are uh, of higher intelligence. You're, we're not talking grunt labor force or, I mean, not to put down anyone in grunt labor force, but we're talking educated people of that time who were pretty much brilliant. They're not like educated people of today, which are like, they don't even know what their name is. Hmm. So the thing is, is they, they were recording what they saw. And many of the things that they saw were just absolutely spectacular. Mm-hmm. And Charles Fort records a bunch of them. Even the U.S. Navy. I've got, uh, what is it? Was it the Shrine? Or it might have been lecture number six, where I show phenomena in the United States Navy uh, science books. Mm. Just absolutely outrageous. They have no clue. They have no clue. <laughs> well, I mean, you do have some other uh, ancient artifacts of coins and other things of unknown animals. It's not completely unheard of. There's actually quite a few old references to animals we just can't identify today, right? Look at Dinosauria. There's a big issue there. And mammals, and every about once or twice a year, there is some creature that washes up on some shore somewhere that is absolutely unidentified. Mm -hmm. Absolutely unidentified. Now, there was a, uh, what was it? They were saying that they had the largest, the largest sea creature ever found, and it was on a an underground camera. Uh, you can type it in on YouTube, I imagine. Hmm. And it shows a creature that's about the size of a, of a, oh, maybe a couple of campers put together or so. You know, it's pretty big. It's pretty big, no doubt. But I was scuba diving off of the coast of San Carlos, Mexico, years ago. And there is, un there under, it's pro the, the water there is probably 30, 35 feet deep. And there is a sponge there that is attached to a rock. And that rock, is the size of a house. It is the size of a two-bedroom house. Hmm. Sunk down in the bay there, and it is covered with one single organism, a sponge. It is absolutely... And you can wave your hand over or close to it. I mean, you can go and feel and touch it, and they all pull in, you know, or there's some kind of member of the sponge family. Or you can just wave your hand a foot in front of it, and they all 
they all respond. Mm. They can, they, they know you're there. They know you're there. And I just, I was just in awe. I mean, that creature, how old would that creature be? Who knows? <laughs> right. Who knows? That's uh, another area where you hear stories like that is the Blue Hole near Belize. I mean, talk about something that could be an entrance to an inner chamber in the earth. I mean, that looks like it when you look at it from uh, like a helicopter flyover. But there's people who talk about seeing giant squid there, a tentacle of a giant squid once in a while. And it's like, man, yeah, who knows? But the bigger something under the ground is, the bigger home it could be for something else, for some type of organism, whether it's a sponge on a rock or a giant squid in a giant hole. Well, you make a point. You make a good point there because I believe there's some of those blue holes off the coast of Bahamas or between Bahamas and uh, Florida. And I believe it's in Ocala they have some of those bottomless holes near Ocala, Florida. Hmm. And some of them, I mean, years ago, I could see them on Google years ago. So I'm sure they're still there. What perplexes me about those, what you call blue holes, which is a fine word for it, they're perfectly round. Yeah. They're perfectly round. They're not like jagged or square or like man this rock here is too tough for me to carve a hole in i'm going to jump around and make people will get the idea when they see it from the air three or four yeah. thousand years ahead of, you know after this but i'm just going to leave this here it doesn't have to be perfect i oh, give or take a couple of inches no it was those guys are perfectly thick circular yeah and and how does that you got me brother you got me i hear you a lot of mysteries out there oh yeah so as far as old maps are concerned, having studied as many ancient maps as you have, having as many as you had in your collection over the years, are there other strange things that have interested you about them that you could share? Well, just some of the descriptions of the people. They, they talk about the Skralingers, the Skralings, and then some of the things that happened later concerning what was known as Skralings. The oldest map that I had was the Beatus River map carved on stone which Yuba's map of rivers by Helios, that had to predate it. Well, that could have been 20, 20 B.C. to 20, 25 B.C. to 25 A.D., who knows, it is somewhere along in there. And that was a, a, as old, that, that was the only map I had carved on stone that I actually owned. But then in one of my other presentations, I showed just dozens of these old maps carved in stone that coincidentally just kind of follow right along with what, some of the obscure information from the Smithsonian had. Mm. It's, a, it's a big, it's a big brain gulp. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah. In terms of types of people, I think one of those maps does describe on the Bargos Islands that there's supposed to be a pygmy race there. So they've got descriptions of a, a race of people there, and we don't even have access to the island apparently. Correct. And and when you see Eskimo, you know, I've met Eskimo people before. I've met I've met some Inuits. They're short, but they're not pygmies. Mm -hmm. And and the Europeans, they were only familiar with the African pygmies. They would not have called a short person like an uh, 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 an Inuit Mexi uh, Eskimo. They would not have called them pygmies unless they were like shorter. I mean, a pygmy, you you, you get the idea is like three and a half to four foot tall or less. And and the Eskimo, they'll go five feet. You know, so I I I have a hard time putting Eskimo into the pygmy category yeah yeah seems like there's something else out there for sure yeah and we talked about freeze land which is awesome i mean to have a island on maps that has many different cities even has a capital on it and then yeah. a couple hundred years later the island is just gone i mean that's quite a mystery but speaking of phantom islands i've been getting a lot of requests to talk about atlantis and you do show one map you say is the oldest known depiction of atlantis what are your thoughts on this mystery well, my thoughts are that I don't have any thoughts. I'm just going to relate to you what, what, what Kircher says in 1663. Mm -hmm. He it says he's quoting from Plato. And, and, and he talks, and now I want to point this out to you, and you might write this down or check it out yourself. I go into that map in more detail during the Denver lecture. Mm -hmm. The Denver lecture. And that's, and it's called the oldest authentic map of Atlantis. It's on YouTube and a bunch of people have embedded it. It's got like several hundred thousand views. But I talk about what uh, uh, Kircher says in his map. And he says he's getting it from Plato, but it's not in Plato of today. So we can say today, unequivocally and accurately, that Plato has been sanitized. He talks about that there was a huge island there and that they had a machine. Okay, he's writing in 1663. They had a machine there that bored through the main mountain range that went through Atlantis. 
that there was a mountain range in Atlantis, and they had this machine that was a mining machine, and that they were mining minerals. And he didn't know, it, it, there was no specification of what exact mineral it was that they were mining, but that the whole mountain w- became honeycombed with tunnels and caves, because or mining passages, I guess would be a better, more accurate depiction, that this machine went through this mountain so much it was just honeycombed, and they had just about mined out all this mineral out of it that they could. And they kept going and through and going through, and, and that there was a slight earthquake, and then right after that slight earthquake, boom, the whole island just collapsed in on top of itself. And that's printed in 1663 in Latin. So it's going to be hard to go back further with that, but I just want to say that there are so many classical authors that mention Atlantis, and I believe I cover that, a sequel to that, in my video called The Shrine. Mm -hmm. The Shrine, I show you all the classical historians, and that's where I point out my round earth theory. (laughs) My round earth theory, that everybody from the ancient world knew the earth was round. (laughs) So in, in that, I show... But they say, oh, Plato, Plato, but I believe it was Strabo, Dionysius, Diodorus, Plank. And there were so many people that mentioned Atlantis. And I, sh- and I show it to you right there. I show it, at you, show it to you out of the book. Mm-hmm. And they were writing, what, 2,000 years ago? It wasn't just Plato. It wasn't just Plato. There were other, but you have to read a lot of books to find these little jewels. I mean, I pick up an old classical book. I have to read the whole book hoping to find one sentence or one jewel, one needle. So. Mm-hmm. Right. And I still have guests to debate where Atlantis was. Where do you place it? Where Where does the research show? Middle of the Atlantic somewhere. Yeah. I mean, it just, just out there along the Atlantic Ridge, possibly. Or I, I believe it was uh, as large as what Athanasius Kircher draws it. I, you know, uh, only only because only because I mean, it could have been smaller or I, he, I thought he did a good job. I thought he did a good job. Mm-hmm. And and now now you've got people putting out videos on Atlantis that are using my photos and my they're lifting their 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 material from my videos, which I don't really mind. You know, it would be nice if they would give some credit. But I have actually seen some Atlantis videos, and they're just using my material right there. You know, and that's what people do today. The, a researcher of today is um, only familiar with Google and Wikipedia. That's it. Mm-hmm. Right. And you make good points about going back to older sources, things from the 1600s to the 1800s. Those are the sources that allow you to bypass the sanitation and the censorship that is so prevalent today. And you're right on. You you get one of these old books just for one great little piece of information. Those are the nuggets I'm hungry for, because there's no question a lot of things have been altered and changed. And that little window of time is where you can probably get some great insights. They didn't have an agenda. You know, they didn't have an agenda to keep people dumb mm-hmm. and or, or or to promote the Darwinian theories or or their theories of government and how people should act and be. They were just trying to document and record accurate information. So it gives you a completely different angle. Mm-hmm. And, and they wrote what they saw in most cases that's, or from uh, reliable sources. So, yeah, I, we don't have that very much anymore. And that's why I, my, when you said that there's nothing else like what I do on the Internet – I take that as a big, big compliment because I'm so happy that you noticed that because I don't feel that there is anything else on the Internet that shows you. Because uh, m- most people, I'm not going to mention names, but I could I could rattle off 40 right now. They make it up as they go. They mm-hmm. don't show you in a book. They don't show you in a book printed before World War II. You know, uh, most historians of today have never, ever held a history book printed before World War II in their hands. They never even held a book, a history book before World War II. They just assumed that everything after World War II is, oh, this is our history. This is correct. And that's what they go by. But, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at here. Look at these books. And that's kind of what I did with, it's a play on words. My searching for Thanksgiving, it really shows you how the history books get twisted as time goes along. That's really, it does, it, I use, I use Thanksgiving as a focal point to show you how history has just gotten so twisted. And then you can apply that really to many more of my subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is great what you do because you take these old sources that they really don't want anybody to know about anymore 
and you propel them and immortalize them by putting them on the internet, which almost nobody's doing because nobody even goes after these old, old sources. They don't have the money and they don't have the resources and they don't have the time. They count the, a researcher. Oh yeah, I, I got, I got to get on Google. I got to get on Google. And that's what we'll talk about later with the giants. I know you wanted to touch some on that. We'll, we'll get to that later. But yeah, you're right. You're right. It's, it's, the people aren't going to take the time to scan a book printed in what 1600 or 1700 or 1800s and, and show you what this guy says mm -hmm. and then show you what they print today that's completely different. <laughs> they don't want you to know. They want everybody to be in step and in line. Mm -hmm. And for people who aren't familiar with you or your collection, can you give us some details about the size and scope of the artifacts in your collection, some of the contents of it? Well, you can see I don't have myself. Let's see. Hang on. I think I only have here one artifact. I only have one artifact. Hmm. But my neighbors and my close friends have like hundreds, so I don't really need them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a video or something, I will borrow artifacts, and I want them stored at different places. I used to have a bunch of artifacts. I had a devastating fire back in 08 that could have been a conspiracy. I don't know, but I had 15, 15 pieces go up in smoke, mm. and and two ancient coins that are worth that were worth probably 50 grand a piece and uh, go up in smoke. I've only got one artifact here now, and it is so absolutely incredible. I could never, ever, ever get rid of it because it crosses so many angles mm -hmm. it's the largest piece of calcite that anybody's ever seen and it glows in the dark and it's just an absolute spectacular artifact wow where'd that come from illinois uh, Ill the illinois caves here gotcha and it's it's absolutely outrageous and so but um i don't consider my ancient coin collection to be artifacts as far as me collecting and what i collect i collect encyclopedia sets and fluorescent phosphorescent minerals, more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. I've got a world class mineral collection that uh, I don't I don't even talk about. You know, nobody's interested in rocks. <laughs> so, you know, unless geologists, scientists, et cetera, et cetera. I I do have a I live out in the middle of a very remote region out in the middle of nowhere. And there's no reason to come and rob me because nobody wants a bunch of old books or a bunch of rocks. <laughs> so, you know, beyond that. Right. But not now I do have one, two, three, four, four boxes of replicated gold pieces. I've got maybe 120 pounds of replicated gold coins, medallions, bars, and ingots that, that I got from the state of Indiana that they got from Jack Ward that him and Russell Burroughs had made hmm. years and years ago, which is pretty spectacular. I mean, you can see a lot of those on my uh, Facebook site, which is Illinois Caves. The Illinois Caves on Facebook. You can see a bunch of artifacts. You can see a bunch of reptilian pieces there. You can see a bunch of decipherments there. And, and extremely obscure ancient languages. I mean, not like <laughs> just extremely obscure ancient languages. Well, that's the thing. There seems to be quite a few languages the mainstream doesn't acknowledge. Your work touches on that a few times, but as far as lost civilizations that these languages might have come from, of course, we talked a little bit about Atlantis, which would definitely have been one of them, but have there been any other cases of lost civilizations that you've come across that have intrigued you? I don't think there's been a lost civilization that hasn't intrigued me. <laughs> they were digging in Ohio, and it was 90 feet down in the ground where they came in, in the bend of a river. For some reason, I've got it in one of my books from the 1800s here. I think it was a print in 1831, where they came across a, a log cabin that had two infants in it and a man and a woman twisted together. Evidently, they were making love. Coitus. Okay, or sleeping with their legs uh, entwined. And just, you know, mud or something, landfall, landslide, something just crushed them in that position. Mm. Which means whatever happened, happened instantaneously. Yeah. And that's what my take is on a lot of ancient history is it happened instantaneously. I believe that, uh, you know, it is my, now I'm going to give you my opinion on some things, but like the Grand Canyon, I don't believe that it took millions and millions and millions of years to form. I believe it was formed in two, boom, just a matter of seconds. And I'll tell you this, I was at a point in Alabama one time uh, looking through a large canyon in my uh, binoculars. And I was looking, it was oh, a couple of miles away, a cloud came in. And a bolt of lightning hit a rock, 
and that rock exploded. It, that rock exploded out into the canyon, and several trees that were above that rock all fell and slid into the canyon all at once. Hmm. And that was a big change in the landscape. And the same thing with uh, Lake Titicaca. I believe that Lake Titicaca was down closer to the surface at one time, maybe even some kind of ocean portal, and then boom, just shot 13,000 feet straight up into the air in a matter of seconds. Woof! Hmm. And then boom, there's nothing left. You know, you're, the, the human body can't take it. Human body can't take it. Can't take landslides. Can't take being crushed. Can't take being frozen. Or, and same thing with some of these, the fossil finds that they have, like in the Rockies, what Green River in Wyoming, where all the fish, thousands of fish, fossilized in stone, and they're all, all their fins are excited. Whatever happened, happened instantaneously. And I'm a cataclysmist. I believe when the big guy upstairs gets tired of it or he wants to change it, he just flicks it right off. So... We were talking about this agenda that occurred largely ramping up after World War II, and it changed a lot of things from these old sources. What are the biggest manipulations you see? What are the biggest differences in some of this old material as compared to what we have now? What they leave out. What they leave out, such as the giants, okay? And you got a lot of people that are real so heavy into giants right now. It's like the giants now are a jump on the band, the giant bandwagon. <laughs> right. Everybody, you got this guy's an expert on giants. This guy, well, they got all their information from Google or Wikipedia. They never read a book about giants. Or or now maybe they have, maybe, oh man, man, they read somewhere there's a reference to an old book in the 1800s. All the books I had from the 1800s had giants in them all over the place. My book, my dad had book on, books on giants back in the 60s. And then, of course, I, I grew up on um, Frank Edwards' works. There's giants in there. There's uh, Charles Fort writes about giants. William Corliss in the 70s and 80s wrote about giants. But none of these none of these guys were ever interested in giants until they hear somebody else mention it. Mm-hmm. That's the thing about even the little people. Even the little people. It goes against the grain of the Darwinian, the Darwinism theory of evolution, and that's what they want everybody to believe. And and I'm going to say it. You know, just straight up, I believe anyone who believes in the theory of evolution is just absolutely blind and ignorant because they don't include things that go against it. Like little people, I can take you out to a place in New Mexico and show you entire villages that are ancient, prehistoric, and all the doors are like 22 inches tall. Really? I mean, just uh, built right into the cliff. Uh, Excuse me, foxes and gophers didn't build that. (laughs) That's true. And and I can't see any humans building a waste in so much time. And you look inside them, and they're like little little households and stuff in there. Well, uh, okay. Well, oh, oh. But if it doesn't, if it's not included in the Darwinian, the Darwinian theory of evolution, which all of a sudden, oh, this I got, I got so many ancient. I mean, fossil books and dinosaur books, and it's all evolution, 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 evolution. And these guys, they ain't ain't got a clue. They Mm -hmm. don't have it. And I will debate any of them anytime, anywhere. And and they better have their act together because I've got all their books. I've got more books about it than they have. And guess what? I've read and underlined mine. I know what they say. So I would, would, it's so easy to crush an evolutionist. So easy, because the only thing an evolutionist knows is what they see on a one hour program on discovery Mm -hmm. or what they've been taught in school or college. You know, or Homo sapien and this and that. Well, where are the bones? Oh, they don't exist, so we'll make them up. Oh, no, here's got this species here. No, no, no. Let's include this species. Let's include this species. Because as you said yourself, okay, let's say, I am surprised that right now with uh, Brian Forrester, who does a lot of work down in Peru with the elongated skulls, that they're even allowing him to to get so much notoriety because these elongated skulls, they're natural. Well, that's a completely different human species. Okay, look at the Calaveras skulls. Look at what they found 500 feet deep in the ground in, in Calaveras County, California. And it was what, somewhere in Utah, under 11 feet of bedrock, they found modern human bones with modern human teeth. Okay. Okay. Well, let's just let's not let's just throw that out. Let's throw that out. That doesn't match our theory. <laughs> Anything that doesn't match. Our, so you got a lot of people that are just totally ignorant, stupid, and blind. And that's what I'm saying about anyone. If you're out there and you're listening and you have, and you believe in the theory of evolution that we all came from monkeys, it is. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You just need to do some more research. <laughs> you need that. You you are falling in step. Because it has to do, to me, the mindset of, oh, well, if my great, 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 granddaddy was a gorilla, uh, that, you know, that means that I'm a descendant of the gorilla. It takes away a spiritual seed. 
And that's what they've done. They've, they've dumbed down the, the dumbing down of America worked far, far better than anyone ever dreamed. <laughs> yeah, I can't argue with that. So it is interesting that you grew up with all this stuff so normalized, giants normalized, the hollow earth idea, not a big deal. Is there anything similar to the giants or maybe other humanoids from our past that you've known about that have yet to be as trendy as the giants? Well, my father was, like I told you, my, my father was into flying saucers and UFOs. He had those books around. So I guess your question is, uh, you're probing to see if I could maybe predict the next trendy <laughs> trendy <laughs> issue. Let me think for a second. Let me think for a second. I, I believe that uh, the ancient buried cities is going to become more of, more in vogue. The buried cities are going, and eventually... Not only giants, but human skulls. People are going to realize at some point, even the scientists, no matter how dumb and stupid the scientists are, and no matter how ignorant and blinded they are, they're going to have to, and, and especially the anthropologists, they're going to have to accept the elongated skulls, the strange, strange skulls that they found out in the American Southwest. I mean, I show several of them. And these books are printed in the 1800s. What can you imagine having skulls like that trying to get a, a book deal printed in today's time? Right, it wouldn't happen. I, you know, you know, oh no, no, no! He's got to be Homo sapien, 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 sapien. You know, uh, but he's not. She is not. They're not. <laughs> and and I'm not so sure about the star child skull. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not so sure about that. But like I say, they there's a bunch of them in Mesa Verde. And there were a bunch of them in in Missouri. They found a whole cemetery of them in Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> and so these are different species of humans. And I have to say that, that oh, oh, like uh, uh, Bill Nye, the stupid guy, he goes and says, oh, no, no, all humans are the same species. Right. Okay. The blacks, the Chinese, the, the Caucasoids, the Native Americans, this and that. Oh, the, everybody's the same species. I just want to make a point. There are two species of metal arc in North America. One lives on the east side of the Mississippi, and one lives on the west side of the Mississippi, pretty much. I think there's a few of the easterns on the west side. There are two species of metal arc. They are the same size. They are the same color in every way. You know what the only difference is? Hmm. Their song. Their song, the way they speak, is the only difference. And they're two different species? Come on. And you're not saying that the Chinese man and or is different than the black man, that everybody's one species. That is just absolute stupidity. <laughs> stupidity. And and I would just love the opportunity to chew some of these scientists to pieces. Chew them to pieces. Eat them for breakfast. Send them home to their mommy with a spank on the fanny and crying. <laughs> Well, I, I would like to see underground cities get more play. I know I've gone through the Chronicling America website, the Library of Congress, where they put all the old newspapers online. I don't even know why they let us have that resource. But you type in underground city and you'll get dozens and dozens of results from the early 1800s, a lot of times in conjunction with those giant skeletons. But they'd go down and they'd find these huge chambers all across the underside of America. It's interesting. That's the word you're, we're using is huge, and the second word we're using is deep. <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking about just down below the sewage level, okay? We're talking, you know, 50, 60, 70 feet deep. And, and that's what they're finding in Egypt, and that's kind of, that's that's some of the stuff that they're finding here in this country today. Mm -hmm. Man, so... Time has just flown by. I know I've asked you a lot of questions. We've covered a lot of ground. Before we get to wrapping up and giving out your links and places where people can follow up on you, I wanted to just give you a minute. Is there anything we didn't discuss that you'd like to get out to the listeners? Anything of interest that you just want to convey? I've got a lot of new stuff coming out. There's always going to be some new material. I just released two videos on ancient coins because that's, I've been collecting ancient coins for over 30 years. I don't know. A long time. And or or whatever, but I've got some other videos on the drawing board, and you know some of my coin, some of my like the ancient coins, they're not just for ancient coin collectors and dealers. The novice can watch them and follow them and not feel stupid. You're going to learn about ancient coins, and you'll know everything. You'll know everything about ancient coins by watching the ancient coin vault one and two, and from that, I'm probably going to have a couple of more. And I've got a lot of videos online. They're just absolute intrigue. 
phenomena and, and, and a lot of just actual things that happened to me that I can relate and I can show you. What, and a lot of it has to do with what I've come across in all my totes. I've got two, two barns full of totes. I just go through, through them and, okay, there's that book. I haven't seen it in 10 years. It's just finding the right the right books and putting together a video on them. Sure. Now, so uh, before we do go, remind people of your website and your YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is Harry Hubbard, and there's all kinds of stuff there. The Facebook is Illinois Cave, The Illinois Caves. Our website is IllinoisCaves.com. And our the site that you can buy two of my books and a few of my articles, from way when or or access articles that I did years ago that are now free of charge that go with, with my books is alexanderhelios.com. Right on. Well, it has been great talking to you. I know you've got plenty more up your sleeve and hopefully we can do this again sometime, but until then, take care of yourself, man. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed talking to you. And I want to just encourage your listeners if they would subscribe to the Harry channel because we're trying to get more subscribers that we're trying to go over a thousand. Right. And you're at 750 right now. So I don't think there's any problem with the size of this audience and getting to a thousand. It should be pretty easy. Thank you. Thank you. And there's plenty of other stuff on YouTube if, if, with other people who have embedded stuff that I even don't show. There's, there's other stuff and interviews and videos that, that I don't even have control over, but they're good. They're yeah. good. So keep it interesting. I'm sure people will keep tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope to talk to you again, too, soon. Will do, man. All right. Thank you. You got it. Have a good evening. You, too. Bye. And boom goes the dynamite, my friends. Man, I have got to say, I loved that show. I love, love, love those strange ancient maps. And I've never met someone who knows so much about them and the map makers themselves. The Bargos Islands are fascinating. Most people who've checked out maps that show a hole at the top of the pole will have seen these islands. Details are always scarce, but Harry had some decent tidbits to relay. I'm not sure. I don't think I've ever heard of Friesland, and that just blew my mind. Why is there this well-defined island with city names and a capital, and it's not in the history books, and there's no information in modern times? I think that's why I like the Hollow Earth idea so much. This idea that there is a ton of mystery left out there, a ton more to explore just beneath our feet. So something like a phantom island is just as fascinating for the same reason. Definitely hop on Harry's YouTube channel and check out that ancient map collection. Tell me if you've ever seen anything like it. I'd be pretty surprised, but I'm a nerd for exactly this kind of thing. Harry, of course, is into all sorts of areas, but I like that he seeks out old hard copy sources, pre-World War II sources, as he says. And he's right. He clearly has gotten a lot of great info from them that just isn't available anywhere else today. Largely about the Grand Canyon, which was a big part of the Plus show. So much untalked about there. Plenty of artifacts to report, all hidden. So that's a great chunk of information. I've been wanting to get a guest on to talk about the things they found at the Grand Canyon region for quite some time, but it just isn't in the repertoire of very many people. Anyway, I'm glad we could finally talk about it, but what really put Harry Hubbard on the map originally was the Illinois Cave Saga. I think this is so wild that apparently the lost tomb of Alexander the Great was found in Marion County, Illinois, after they came up the Mississippi in ancient times. Lots of gold artifacts have been found there, aliens, reptilians, everything in between. The fact that it's there at all is pretty amazing. And when I looked up Harry originally... After a Plus member had suggested I get him on, the Illinois Cave story came up and it totally all came rushing back that I had heard about this years ago and I had thought it was just amazing. But when I was talking to him about coming on, he mentioned that he's talked about the Illinois Caves thing hundreds of times in hundreds of interviews and there's so much more worth talking about that he's researched over the years. So we went in many other areas first, but we had to hit his bread and butter in the second hour. Besides, it's good to get updates on old stories, and I really want to go there. I, don't, I really don't care if I get arrested. I just got to go see. That got me thinking about a higher side explorers group. I mean, maybe something for the plus forms, but whether I can go or not, there's a lot of stuff worth exploring here in the States, and we could have little expeditions to go check some of it out, right? Maybe post something in the forum, and if three or four like-minded people are around, you could all meet up and go do some exploring. Fuck it. I think that'd be pretty awesome. You know, I got some messages recently from people that were afraid I was getting away from the weird stuff, but worry not. 
You should be confident that THC will never change in any major way. I've seen too many shows I love go way off the reservation and go irrelevant. And sure, we'll evolve, I guess. I don't want to do the exact same shows over and over again, but I'm very conscious of these sorts of things, and I love the weird. Ultimately, I'd like to get the show so dialed in that we have, like, one practical geopolitical global conspiracy current events show a month, one expose on a particular group, family, or company, that type of thing, one about magic and things in that realm of even possibly self-improvement, one about cryptids or aliens or the hollow earth, and one about science or medicine conspiracies. That would be my dream, but I can't even get a schedule set, so this kind of fine-tuning is probably a bit lofty. I recognize I could balance better, but don't ever think I'm going to completely get away from this kind of thing. Sometimes these really strange niche areas, they need to advance a little before I can really do another show or we're going to be hearing the same coast-to-coast bullet points all the time, and we got to avoid that. Nobody wants that. So don't ever think I have abandoned high strangeness. I just want there to be some substance. And if I find a field to be a bit stagnant, then it's going to take some time before I can find a researcher with a unique angle or something happens. But I got the helm of this ship and I'm going to steer it as best I can and worry not because I've been doing it for quite some time. But that does it for me. Do subscribe to Harry Hubbard's YouTube channel. Let him know we have passionate listeners so that when I ask him to do it again, perhaps he'll be inclined to say yes. Plus, he works hard on this stuff, and it kind of sucks to feel like nobody's tuning in. I've known that pain, believe me. Let's get him over a 1,000 subscribers, though. He's not asking you to buy a book or download a rental of his movie for $7.99. He just wants you to check out the result of decades of work and blood, sweat, and tears. So let's make the man's day. I think we could easily get him to 10,000 subscribers, but we'd need a decent amount of participation there. But also, let me know if you'd like to go deeper down the rabbit hole with Harry, and I'll get him back on. Your feedback is uh, kind of important, right? But until that day, we're going to call this meeting of the Midnight Society closed, and it's your move, Smithsonian whitewashers and crafty concealers of our mysterious world. Your fucking move. Lucid dreams are so vivid Cause you go to bed at seven And your brain comes alive Cause you hate your nine to five You wake up with a dread And make sure your cats are fed Did your brain talk to a ghost Who moved your coffee and your toast As you listen to the higher side chats You get to your desk And your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows To a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around You insert a steady sound The OM says turn it down And you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'll be invited To Bohemia Grove To a Bilderberg Club Oh, do you think you'll be invited by a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down to the center of the earth Through the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench from the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down, and the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you, cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. 
I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable, and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent, one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners, submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the Entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle. Sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time?